Gloria Patri e Figlio e Spirito e Santo, Sico sì, della in principio e noi che sempre e in secolo da secolo con Amen. Exurge, quale è il tuo domino, exurge nel repello a sentire, quale è facile in giorno verde, sopravvisci le tribolazioni nostre, e desidera venti le nostre, exurge dove agli per nostre libera le nostre. Chi li è eleisa? Chi li è eleisa? Cristo è eleisa? Chi li è eleisa? Dominus Pavis Gum, Dominus Deus be conspicuous, we exnulla not action and conspicuous, Concede propitius, o contato di azione a dottore scienze protezione moniamo per domino nostro mi è un Cristo vinium tuo qui te convivere regna in unità dei spiriti santi Deus per omnia secola secolo Ti Paoli apposi a Giovinzio, quante le bende su verde di stipiente, scomsidi si sapiente. Susi nei disegni di questo posto in sé, vedo di reggere, si queste porra, si questa oggi, si questa ex solito, si questa in faccia e mosche. Secondo in nobilità attendico, quasi nos infirmi fuerimus in accorte. In quoquis ader in insipiente dico, audeo et ego, every soul that ego. Israel is an ego, Simabra is soon at ego. Minus the Christ is soon to minus a being stiko plus ego. In la polibus plurimus in cacere plus abundantius. In plagio supramolo in morte plus frequente. Aiuta e squinque e squadra e tiene su una minus a cevi. E la vigi c'è su un stemme l'abitato su. E una frigge in frigge e non ti dia in profondo male scuri. E ti nere vosse per pericolo, scuri per pericolo, la tono per pericolo, sex genere. Pericolo, sex genere, pericolo, sensibilità di pericolo, si solitudine, pericolo, si mani, pericolo, si impasse, si attribuzzi. In labore di runa e vigilismo di simpame e siti, in eunismo di figure e nuditate. Prete e la questrenza con su un'istanzia mea quotidiana, sollecito di ogni mia ecclesia. Cui si infirma due dico non infirmo, Qui scandalizzato l'ego non urro, si gloria riappode, qui infimità di smesso ne gloria. Deo se pade domino, si Gesù Cristi, qui sbenedito si insegue il circuito non mensile. Tamaci preposti lucini sarete regi scustori e vincipitati in domenici non lo vuol me comprendere e per fenestra mi spote di mi su su per muro mi si che fuggi in mano segus Si gloria e apote non esperi qui le vini e madre e visione se rivelazione e domini 
In the Rogabane of any of the Shibreos, quiet in April, Quibusip, say the seed, Bobbis out of his nose, a mystery of rainy days, a dress out of him, Parabolis, Ovidian is non vinia, the Larian is non intelligent. Is all in a parabola, semen is bare of we are in the Gothia, we are out the yond, then the Vina Diablo, the Telefilm, the Corda, the Yorum, the Crate, and the Salvi Fiat. Now we super rapid from Quigomani and the Congario to shoot you and film and irradiate none of them. We are temple, queen of the temple, and the Tatsian is rich. Volate in spinas cecinide, e sono qui a dire una della sua tricitudini, bose di vizi, di volontà, di vostri, di un testo, di accanto e non rivero il fuoco. Qui a te in ponna per terra, e sono qui in coro di oggi, di oggi, di suo buon retine, e frutto la vera di pazienza. It's Sextagesima Sunday, and you have the long readings in the propers, which are left at the back of the church, the proper prayers and readings, so you can all follow them on the literature rack. The epistle for today is taken from the second letter of the Apostle St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brethren, you gladly suffer the foolish, whereas Yourselves are wise. For you suffer if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take from you, if a man be lifted up, if a man strike you on the face. I speak according to dishonor, as if we had been weak in this part. Wherein if any man dare, I speak foolishly, I dare also. The Hebrews so am I. They are Israelites, so am I. They are the seed of Abraham, so am I. They are the ministers of Christ. I speak as one less wise. I am more. In many more labors, in prisons more frequently, in stripes above measure, in death often of the Jews. Five times did I receive forty stripes, say one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once I was stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I was in the depth of the sea, in journeying often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils from my own nation, in perils from the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils from false brethren, in labor and painfulness, in much watchings, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and in nakedness, besides those things which are without, my daily instance, the solicitude for all the churches, who is weak, and I am not weak, who is scandalized, and I am not on fire, if I must needs glory, I will glory of the things that concern my infirmity, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knoweth that I lie not. 
At Damascus, the governor of the nation, and Aretas, the king, guarded the city of the Damascenes to apprehend me. And through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall, and so escaped his hands. And if I must glory, it is not expedient indeed, but I will come to the visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I know not, or out of the body I know not, God that knoweth, such a one wrapped even to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God that knoweth, that who is caught up into paradise and heard secret words which it is not granted to man to utter. For such an one I will glory, but for myself I will glory nothing but in my infirmities. For though I should have a mind to glory, I shall not be foolish, for I will say the truth, but I forbear, lest any man should think of me about that which he seeth in me, or anything he heareth from me. And lest the greatness of the revelation should exalt me, there was given me a sting of my flesh, an angel of Satan, to buffet me, for which thing thrice I besought the Lord that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for power is made perfect in infirmity. Gladly, therefore, will I glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may dwell in me. And the Holy Gospel is taken from the Gospel according to St. Luke. At that time, when a very great multitude was gathered together and hastened out of the cities unto him, he spoke by similitude. The sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And other some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away, because it had no moisture. And other some fell among thorns, and the thorns growing up with it, choked it. And other some fell upon good ground, and being sprung up, yielded fruit a hundredfold. Saying these things, he cried out, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And his disciples asked him what this parable might be. To whom he said, to you, it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but to the rest in parables, that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God, and they by the wayside are they that hear, then the devil cometh and taketh the word out of their heart, lest believing they should be saved. Now they upon a rock, are they who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no roots, for they believe for a while, and in time of temptation they fall away. And that which fell among thorns, are they who have heard, and going their way are choked with the cares and riches and pleasures of this life, and yield no fruit. But that on the good ground, are they who in a good and perfect heart, Hearing the word, keep it, and bring forth fruit in patience. Just a couple of announcements. I still have copies of the February Eucharistic Crusade newsletter for the children who may have completed their treasure sheets and would like a copy of that. Reminder that Lent begins in 10 days' time with Ash Wednesday. Start thinking of your Lenten resolutions. And if you can remember to bring your palms next Sunday, we'll burn those palms to make ashes for Ash Wednesday. We'll be doing the Way of the Cross every Friday during Lent. Now ask your prayers to help us recover our stolen vehicle, that Nissan pickup. Pray to St. Anthony as we are. In the name of the Father, 
and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Gladly, therefore, will I glory in my infirmities. Reading through this epistle, this selection from St. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, you might well be very confused. Is he bragging or not? Is he boasting or not? Is he allowed to boast about the things he's done or not? Is he humble or proud? What is he doing? At times he boasts, then he says, it's not good for me to boast, and then he boasts. Hmm. Strange. You might think. This epistle, the second to the Corinthians, was written by St. Paul as a defense of himself and of his mission against false preachers who had entered in, in amongst the Corinthians. And so to defend himself, he's bound to say some of the graces he has received, some of the privileges he has, and all the things he has suffered. How many times he's been scourged, beaten, put in prison, three times shipwrecked, and he has one more to go. Later on he'll be shipwrecked on Malta as well. How much he suffered in so many ways for the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Is he boasting or not? We have to place this section into context. And the context is this. He begins by saying that I must preach the meekness and the modesty of Christ my Lord. And if any man boasts, he must boast in the Lord only. And he goes on to speak about himself, how people say his epistles are heavy and hard to understand, but he himself, most impressive little man, unimpressive, and his speech of no account. He says it himself. Human gifts, he was lacking. And he admits it. But then, he starts to talk about his mission and what he did. It's really a com compliment to what he said in his first letter to the Corinthians when he says, I'm not worthy to be an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. I was like one born out of due time. But by the grace of God, I am what I am and his grace has not been made void. Gladly, therefore, will I glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ might be made manifest in me. We find the answer to this apparent paradox in the distinction between the natural and the supernatural. St. Paul, naturally, yes, he was the son of Abraham. He was a Hebrew and had every right to preach to the Jews the resurrection of Christ. But otherwise, he was not naturally very gifted, nor very impressive. But supernaturally, he speaks about the power of God's grace, the power of the cross, which is manifested in him. It's not his, but it's Christ's. And he says, if I must boast, it's not expedient so to do, but I will boast in the power and the grace of Christ which is made manifest. Then he goes on to say that although he has to defend himself and defend his mission that he received from Christ our Lord, he doesn't do so out of pride, but it's his duty to do so in midst of the truth. It's the mission he received. Then he goes on to say that because of the greatness of the revelations that were given to him, lest... They might lift him up, lest he might have pride. Then God gave to him a sting of my flesh, an angel of Satan, he says, to buffet me. A temptation, a weakness, a human weakness. That's what he's talking about. And he 
besought the Lord three times that he might remove this from him, but the Lord did not. And his answer was, My grace is sufficient for thee, for power is made perfect in infirmity. He stays weak. He, he acknowledges his weakness. He feels his weakness in his own body and his flesh. And that's what keeps him humble despite all the great revelations he received. And that's why he continues. We didn't read this verse. It's the next one. Therefore I am pleased with all the humiliations and the sufferings and the persecution and the anguish that come upon me. Because when I am weak, then I am strong. Huh. Apparent paradox. When I'm weak, I'm strong. When he's weak in a human way, when he feels the greatness of his weakness, and he cannot depend upon himself, that's when he is strong in the supernatural order by the grace of God. So you see, St. Paul is not proud at all. Very humble, in fact. He knows he's nothing. And his boasting is opposed to the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, which made him an apostle, though he's unworthy to be one. Now, there is a, there's a message here. St. Paul retained his humility despite the greatness of his vocation because of all the sufferings, humiliations, insults, despised by his own, rejected by so many, and his own personal human weakness, which he experienced. That's what kept him humble so that he could be the vehicle and the instrument of grace. Well, it's not any different for us, you know. And it's mentioned by St. John in the Apocalypse when he has this to say. We all know the passage in the Apocalypse where Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man open to me, then I will come in and I will sup with him and he with me. We know that text. We've seen the pictures of it many times. But what we don't know so well is the verse that precedes and the verse that follows. Now the verse that precedes is this. Those whom I love, I rebuke and chastise. that you might be gold proven by the fire. A rebuke and chastise. And the verse that follows, that he who overcomes, he will sit with me on the throne. And so, Almighty God rebukes and chastises those whom he loves, by all kinds of humiliations. And that's how we can vanquish those humiliations by which God chastises us. Sufferings, physical sufferings, rejection by our friends or our relatives or our loved ones, making mistakes, realizing our silliness, our faults, our sins, our weaknesses that we have in us, even our sins. And that's why St. John says, Be zealous, therefore, and do penance. Then I will come and knock at the door of your heart. I rebuke you, I chastise you, be zealous, do penance, I will knock at the door of your heart. That's God's way of doing things. And that's how he keeps us humble. You see, we're all inclined to pride. It's the most universal temptation that there can be a fallen human nature. It was, as you know, the root of the sin of the angels who refused to serve, the root of the sin of our first parents who refused to obey God's commandments out of pride. In fact, St. Paul mentions it in this very chapter of his letter to the Corinthians. He said, I would not have you, like Eve, be seduced by the temptations of the serpent. 
who by his subtlety took Eve away from the simplicity of heart which God gave her. It was pride. Pride is a universal temptation. And there's a special difficulty with pride. It's this. With other sins that we might commit, we avoid the sin by avoiding the occasion of sin, the place of temptation. You know, you don't get drunk because you don't drink too much, you don't go to the pub, things like this. You don't fall into sins of, um, of um, rash judgment, or calumny because you don't get into bad conversations. You avoid the, the circumstances. But pride, we can't avoid the occasions. Why? Because whenever we do something good, we are tempted to pride. And you can't stop doing good. Whenever we do things well in the natural order, we are tempted to think, ah, I'm such a good person. Whenever we practice charity or kindness or forgive our enemy or help others out in need or give alms, ah, I'm a good person. I'm special. I'm great. I'm wonderful. We are tempted. And so you can't avoid the occasions that lead to pride because we have to do good. And when the more good we do, the more generous we are, the greater sacrifices we make, the more gifted we are, the better we are, the more we are tempted to pride, which is, alas, and has been the fall of many men and many of us. And so, it's so important for us to know what is the work of God's grace in our souls that we can constantly fight against the danger of pride, taking pride in our own selves. There are four kinds of pride that can come upon us. Pride in our mind, pride in our hearts, pride in our words, and pride in our actions. Pride in our mind takes place when we think we know better than others. We know better than our elders and those who have gone before us. We know better than the church. We judge things for ourselves. We are independent-minded. We are able to make up our own decisions on everything. We don't need to ask for advice. We know. That pride of the mind is the sin of the modern world, which has rejected the wisdom of former times, the wisdom of the gospel, the wisdom of the faith. It's a sin of the liberals in general, liberalism, which is a pride of the mind which insists on its own independence of judgment and rejects then the teachings of the gospel, the commandments of God, and so on. Modernism, which reinterprets the faith in a relativistic manner, in a subjectivistic manner, is the fruit of pride which has altered the eternal notion of the truth, as St. Pius X says. When the modernists corrupt and destroy the doctrines of our faith, they're doing so out of pride. They undermine the physical resurrection, the divinity of Christ, the reality of the real presence, the reverence due to Almighty God, the spirit of adoration, the, the notion that masses are true and proper sacrifices, all undermined by modernists out of their own pride and self-judgment. But then there's pride of the heart. Pride of the heart is when we try to make ourselves look good to others. We want to be admired and loved and appreciated for our own selves. We want others to look up to us. We want them to praise us. We and we act as if we are the center of the world. A grave disorder indeed. Pride is the disordered attachment to our own excellence. To fight against pride does not mean not to be excellent, but it means not to be attached to our excellence. To understand the excellence comes from God. Not to desire for our own selves, but for the love of God. 
Let's have an upright heart, a sincere heart, a heart which seeks God's honor and glory, not our own. And that means a constant battle to purify our intentions, to offer our prayers up that we might love and serve God alone and not seek our own selves, not seek to be praised and honored and admired and by others. Huh. Constant battle. Pride in our words is when we speak in a way as if to brag about ourselves, to talk about ourselves, to talk about our gifts, to talk about our abilities. It's not pride in words to say the truth when we have to say the truth. To explain what we really can do. That's not pride. But to brag about it, to talk about it, to be filled up with our own importance, that's pride in our words. And it's obnoxious. And nobody likes it. But if it's obnoxious to our fellow man, how much more obnoxious must it be to Almighty God? Then there's pride in our actions. When we do things to be seen by others. This is the height of hypocrisy, but a temptation which we all fall into to keep the rules, to practice charity, to say something nice to somebody, to help out a person who is sick, because we want to be seen by others. That was the hypocrisy of the Pharisees that our divine Saviour condemned so much. And it was possible because they were doing good things. The Pharisee did good things. He gave his tithes. He fasted twice a week. He helped the poor. He did lots of good things. But he did it to be seen by men. I thank the Lord that I'm not like the rest of men, was his prayer, full of pride. And that's why he's condemned. It's not the excellence of his works that he's condemned, but taking pride in them for himself and doing them to be seen by others. The heart of man is so devious that we so easily fall into this trap. And that's why it is, precisely why it is, that God rebukes and chastises those whom he loves to keep us humble so that we don't take pride in our own selves. The sufferings, the pains, the difficulties, the anguishes, the betrayals, the sicknesses, the failures in business, all of these things have a purpose in God's plan. And it is to keep us humble and abandoned to his holy will, which comes from humility. It is to maintain that purity of intention in our hearts to serve God alone. In the great saints, we read about the dark night of the soul in which then they go through this darkness which eliminates from them all trust in their own selves, in their own prayers, in their own efforts. They're totally abandoned into God's hands in that darkness which they experience. We may not be mystical, but we all have to fight against pride. and We all have to discover our own nothingness by the events and circumstances that God sends in our path that make us not trust in our own selves anymore. That was the sense of the colic prayer of this Mass in which we prayed to Almighty God that because we do not trust in any action of our own that we might receive the help that we need from Almighty God. It's also the case with the church. The church, the Catholic church throughout its history has constantly suffered. Suffered persecution from without, suffered from the infidelity of so many from within. Suffered anguish and pain from the difficulties of daily life, from betrayals. The history of the church is not a glorious history going from one wonderful thing to another, but a constant battle between good and evil. Some progress and some against. 
some blessings, some sufferings, some building of churches and schools and then being destroyed by the enemies or by the Catholics themselves. Don't have to come to the French Revolution to see that happening. It happens throughout history. And this constant battle is what keeps the church pure and humble in its intentions. So that it is not attached to the things of this earth because the church is to give us heaven, eternal salvation. Persecution and suffering and anguish and pain is a part of the life of the church as it is for every one of our souls. It's the cross, which is lived in the life of the church. And if we complain about this crisis in the church that we're now living, it goes for so long, and there's so many betrayals from within, attacks from without. And it's certainly true, the church is attacked from without as never before, from within by betrayals as never before. Take the pedophile crisis as one example. Attacks from without brought about by the infidelity from within. And one can take so many other aspects of the crisis in the church. Why is the mass attacked? Because Catholics no longer have the reverence and adoration and prayerfulness that they ought to have. They no longer believe it's a true and proper sacrifice. So of course it's attacked from without. But it's through that suffering and anguish and difficulty that the church continues to live and to shine forth. And that displays the mystery of the church is the mystery of grace. Just as the mystery of our souls is the mystery of grace, just as the mystery of St. Paul's soul was the mystery of grace. When he was weak and he was strong, he rejoices in his infirmity. God's grace is made manifest. It's the power of the cross. It's not for nothing that the imitation of Christ says that there is no hope of heaven without the cross. No way to heaven, no way to everlasting life without the holy road of the cross and mortification. Because this is what keeps us in our place, humble. And as we prepare for Lent, let us remember that. We need to make sense of all the humiliations and sufferings and difficulties and pains of every day. That God sends us in his plan of providence that all have a lesson for us and they keep us humble. They keep us docile to God's grace. And they enable us to overcome our inbred pride and fight against it constantly and to examine ourselves constantly against this terrible vice which destroys the work of grace in our souls. And that's why it is we must pray to the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Mother most pure, the most humble of all virgins, that she might teach us to understand the heart of her divine son, the humility that is so necessary if we are to follow her example for the Lord has regarded the lowliness of his handmaid. And she teaches us by her humility and her example to understand those words of Jesus when he says to us, when he says to us, that we must be meek and humble of heart and we will find rest for our souls. For my burden is easy and my yoke is light. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, amen.
Nobis quoque peccaturibus.
Miseriato veste omnipotente Deus, et in mis spiegatis veste, spiegat vostra vita eterna. Indulgentia absoluta in me remissione e peccatolo veste contigo a vobis omnipotente misericordios dominus. Ecce agnus Dei, ecce quittoni de peccato mundi, Domine non sum dignus, curinta e sutectum meum, se tanto di verbo e se nabito anima mea. Domine non sum dignus, curinta e sutectum meum, se tanto di verbo e se nabito anima mea. Domine non sum dignus, curinta e sutectum meum, Se tanto dic verbo es in abito anima mea. Opus Domini Nostri Jesus. Historia de Levantum Mea. Amen. Opus Domini Nostri Jesus. Historia de Levantum Mea. Amen. Opus Domini Nostri Jesus. Historia de Levantum Mea. Opus Domini Nostri Jesus. Historia de Levantum Mea. Opus Domini Jesu Christi, Historia de Levantum de Vita. Opus Domini Jesu Christi, Historia de Levantum de Vita. Opus Domini Jesu Christi, Historia de Levantum de Vita. Opus Domini Jesu Christi, Historia de Levantum de Vita. Opus Domini Jesu Christi, Historia de la Vita de Vita. Opus Domini Jesu Christi, Historia de la Vita de Vita. Opus Domini Jesu Christi, Historia de la Vita de Vita. Opus Domini Jesu Christi, Historia de la Vita de Vita. Opus Domini Jesu Christi, Historia de la Vita de Vita. Opus Domini Nostri Jesu Christi, Custodia et Animum Tua Mi Vita Mi Opus Domini Nostri Jesu Christi, Custodia et Animum Tua Mi Vita Mi Opus Domini Nostri Jesu Christi, Custodia et Animum Tua Mi Vita Mi Opus Domini Nostri Jesu Christi, Custodia et Animum Tua Mi Vita Mi Opus Domini Nostri Jesu Christi, Custodia et Animum Tua Mi Vita Mi Opus Domini Nostri Jesu Christi, Custodia et Animum Tua Mi Vita Mi Opus Domini Nostri Jesu Christi, Custodia et Animum Tua Mi Vita Mi Opus Domini Nostri Jesu Christi, Custodia et Animum Tua Mi Vita Mi Opus Domini Nostri Jesu Christi, Custodia et Animum Tua Mi Vita Mi Opus Domini Nostri Jesu Christi, Custodia et Animum Tua Mi Vita Mi Opus Domini Nostri Jesu Christi, Custodia et Animum Tua Mi Vita Mi Opus Domini Nostri Jesu Christi, Custodia et Animum Tua Mi Vita Mi Opus Domini Nostri Jesu Christi, Custodia et Animum Tua Mi Vita Mi Opus Domini Nostri Jesu Christi, Custodia et Animum Tua Mi Vita Mi
Intuí por la tarde de ella, de mujer y tete que hace vencita. Dame las claves.
benedic ad vos omnipotens Deus, Pater et Filius et Spiritus Sanctus. Dominus et Vobis. Inizio in Santi Evangelii secondo Giovanni. In principio era il verbo, il verbo mi era capo del tempo, e Deus era il verbo, ma che era il principio, il verbo del Ogni perizio, fatto solo il sinistro, fatto il mese, il mese, il fatto il mese. In ipso fide era te fide la vox domino, non si intende, vi succede, teneva e io non comprendo il mondo. Due domani a me si sa Dio come il nome era più a te. I beni di testimonio, voi testimoni per libere te, lui mi ne ho donne e scredere in te il mondo. Non era di le luce, lo testimonio per libere te, lui mi ne ho donne e scredere in te il mondo. Era per sfera, lui mi ne ha donne e mommi ne venite meno con il mondo. Il mondo era di modo per ipso, non fatto se il mondo se non cambia di te. In propria beni te, lui mi ne ho donne e scredere in te. Qualcuno te resce per lo tempo dei ritei, spari stare in fili, ossa e dei figli. Io spi credo di nomi, ne ho spi non è sanguini, vos ne quei svolontà di caro, ne ho quei svolontà di vili, se rei stai una fissa. E per un caro fatto ne è che, e da vita vedi in nobi se fissi, ma se colori a me, e se colori a quasi fini geniti, a parte per un grazie e per il mio. Se un grazie e per il mio. 